Good evening, everyone. I welcome you to our workers' training tonight in Jesus' name. It's going to be a special night. For me, it will be in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for the glorious opportunity of coming before you as your workers, as your servants, as people of proof producers. Lord, we're praying tonight your word will enrich us and move us forward in Jesus' name. We will be a fruit. I will be a fruit. Everyone will be a fruit. We pray, Lord, you'll prepare us for fruit bearing as we're waiting and expecting the coming of the Lord in Jesus' name. Touch everyone. Turn us around. Transform our lives that will never be the same again in Jesus' name. Fulfill your word in everyone. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church of God said, We're coming to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 9 and verse 10. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we add unto you, and how ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and the true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven. Christ is coming again, and the church is waiting, and every Christian ought to be waiting. Verse 10, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Now you will see in those two verses, number one, an experience. Number two, an expectation. Number three, there should be exploits. Number one, there is an experience already that these believers had experienced the Lord. And they are turned away from their sins. They are turned away from dead idols. And they have turned to the living and true God. And now expectation. And to wait for his son from heaven. They were expecting Christ to come. Because the prophecies had been given. That Christ was coming the second time. Whom he raised from the dead. Even Jesus which delivered us from the wrath to come. And because we are delivered, we now reach out and go out to other people to reach out to them and get them delivered and we do exploits in the name of the Lord in Jesus' name. We are talking tonight about the prophecy that Christ himself gave, that he will be coming again. Not only that, you know that last week we studied on standing on the promises. There are many people where they learn something, they put that in a shell. They forget about that. They come to learn a new thing now. And then once they learn this new thing, they will put it also on the shelf. They are waiting for another thing. But the Lord is telling us that what we learn should be, allow me to use this word, cumulative. That means we have this, whatever we learn, we add, whatever we learn, we add, and the foundation is never destroyed. And we're carrying on everything that we have learned. That's why I'm going to combine what we learned last week and what we're learning today. I'm going to combine everything together. The message tonight is standing on the promises while waiting for Christ's coming. We're waiting for Christ's coming. We're expecting Christ's coming. And we know that he's going to come because the Lord himself spoke about it I'm coming again because the Old Testament prophet spoke about it is coming again the second time even the angels spoke about his second coming and the apostles of the New Testament spoke about the, the second coming and then the Holy Ghost spoke about the coming of the Lord again there is no doubt it is certain Christ is coming again and because of that, the whole church is waiting. 
because of that, every Christian is waiting for his coming. While we're waiting, we're trusting him. While we're waiting, we're believing him. While we're waiting, we're acting on his precious and unfailing promises. What are those promises for? For one, to do his will. He says he'll equip us. He'll possess us. He will empower us so that we can do his will. While we're waiting for his coming, we're not just folding our hands. We're not waiting in idleness. We're waiting and doing his will. Number two, we're living in victory. Because of the victory of the first coming, he came first. He died on the cross of Calvary and he said it is finished. We must not allow the first coming to be wasted while we're waiting for the second coming. That's why we're acting on the precious promise that is unfailing, that we will live for his glory. Number three to four, to overcome all opposition. Opposition will come. Like it came in the Old Testament, it will come. Like it came in the New Testament period, it will come. Like the Pharisees and the Sadducees opposed everything the disciples were supposed to do, opposition will come. But thank God we have the promise of God, we will overcome. I have overcome. I will overcome. You see, whatever comes, many times, our position may look like a mountain. But the Lord has directed us and told us what to do about the mountain. We we'll speak to every mountain. Every mountain must move. And so, as we make use of what we got through the first coming, and we're waiting for the second coming in the interim, we overcome all opposition. Number four, we're healed, and then we become divine healing carriers. We carry the healing power of the Lord. I carry the healing power of the Lord. And anywhere, go and everywhere, go, you know, between the first coming and the second coming, he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And he says, you lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. There are many people that separate the first coming from the second coming. And uh, some of them, they only hold to the first coming. And they do not think about the second coming. Other people, they think about the second coming, but they never think about what has been accomplished in the first coming. But the real believer is standing in between. On the one hand, the first coming. On the second hand, the second coming. First coming, second coming. And then in the middle, he's uh, casting out devils, he's sealing the sick, he's being expressed for the Lord, he's evangelizing, he's doing what what he ought to do for the kingdom of God because the king is coming. Number, number five or number six is to bear fruit, abiding fruit. To bear fruit, to bear abiding fruit. He said, you have not chosen me, I have chosen you so that you will go and bear fruit and your fruit will remain. My fruit will abide. My fruit will remain. Your fruit will remain in Jesus' name. Number six now is to possess our possession. What's the, what's the use? He came the first time. And when he came the first time, he did something on the cross of Calvary. He provided something you know, on the cross of Calvary. And people have not even possessed their possession, which was given to them in the first coming. And empty-handed, they're waiting for the second coming. And I say, what good has the first coming been to you? He looks at his life. He says, I cannot tell. I say, he wants you to possess the possession that was provided at the first coming while you are waiting for the second coming. And then he gives us the promise that he'll keep us faithful and we will endure until the end. It says, iniquity shall abound. But even though iniquity is abounding, the love of many waxing cold, they that shall endure to the end, they shall be saved. I will endure to the end. I will not fade out. I will not be washed off. I will not be knocked down. I will not die in the middle of the way. I am moving on. I am moving up. And I'm going to endure till the end in Jesus' name. 
anything that comes is like a light affliction. It's like something flimsy and something you know, negligible. And with the power of faith and the prayer, importunate prayer, all those things that come, I will sweep them out of the way. I said, I will sweep them out of the way. Nothing will stop the journey of a bold, courageous uh, person who is on pilgrimage and he wants to get to that final end. Nothing will stop you. I'm talking tonight, as I told you, standing on the promises while waiting for Christ's second coming. Three things we're looking at. Number one, standing on the promises and sufficiency of Christ. Standing on the promises and the sufficiency of Christ. Christ is sufficient for you. Christ is sufficient for me. Christ is sufficient for our church. There is nothing, there is no body, there is no mountain, there is no problem that, that can ever arise that you'll say, I, is there a promise for this one? Is there power for this one? Is there privilege for this one? Is there possibilities for this one? As you believe in your journey, all things are possible in Jesus' name. Standing on the promises and sufficiency of Christ. Point number two. Spreading the prophecy of his second coming. Don't just hold it to your chest, to your heart, secretly and privately and personally. Talk about it. Christ is coming again. Spread it. Announce it. Say it everywhere in the world. Anywhere you find yourself and the opportunity arises, spread the, promise, the prophecy of his second coming. Point number two, spreading the prophecy of his second coming. Point number three, serving in the power of the Spirit with conviction. While you are waiting for the second coming of the Lord, while you are waiting for the fulfillment of the coming of the Lord, you serve in the power of the Spirit with conviction. You'll have conviction. You know, there are some people, they're serving, but they're dull. They're serving, but they're weak. They're serving, but they're spineless. They're serving, but there's no courage. They're serving, they're almost pinching. Although they try to carry on. It's like, you know, I come to the workers' meeting. I go to the health fellowship. I go to my district. I do what I'm told to do, but oh my... I'm tired. When are they going to relieve me? When will somebody take this sin off me? There's no conviction. And there's no confidence. And there's no courage. But from today, in the power of the Spirit of God, you'll serve with conviction. You'll serve with confidence. And you'll serve with courage. And anything that stands in the way, while you're serving, you'll not be waiting for pastor, for GS, for somebody to come and clear it for you. You will clear it out of the way. Yeah. You know, it's when somebody doesn't want to work that you'll say, you know, a lion is in the way. Difficulties are in the way. Persecutors are there. I don't think I, I would have done this, but look at this, but look at this. There is nothing to look at anymore. The power abides in you. And the power resides in you. Everything there is to do, you will do with courage and conviction and boldness in Jesus' name. Point number three, serving in the power of the Spirit with conviction. Point number one. What's uh, your point number one over there? Standing on the promises and sufficiency of Christ. We're coming to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, and we're reading from verse, uh, we're reading from verse 17. Romans chapter 4, we're reading from verse 17. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed. See that? He believed. Even God, who quickens the dead and uh, calleth those things which be not as though they were. And then he says, who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, 
according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not is somebody now dead. When he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but he was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being how persuaded? I said, how, you, how are you persuaded? And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. When there is persuasion in your heart, there's going to be a performance in your life. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him. But for us also, he's talking about Abraham. He's talking about the faith of Abraham. He's talking about the performance of the life of Abraham. And he said, it's not just for him, imparted to him imputed on him but it is also for us to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up jesus our lord from the dead who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification we're talking about standing on the Pro, on the promises, there are people who are sitting with their problems in the premises of their problems. And they're always talking about their problems, always complaining about their problem, always thinking about the mountain, always talking about their challenges. They're, the promises are there and we stand on the promise of God. Look at Abraham. Abraham stood on the promise of God. Can I point out to you what the Lord expects you and I to do as we look at the promise he has given us like Abraham, number one, we believe in God who sees his deeds completed before the commencement. He saw the deeds completed before the commencement. And after you have prayed, even before you see anything at all, before you see any change at all, before you see any turnout at all, before you see the healing, before you see the power, before you see the courage, before you see any change, any transformation, you see it done before you see it done. Look at that. You see it done, you count it done, you believe it is done, counting those things be, which be not as though they were. And so you are going about, you are rejoicing, you are happy, you know that your prayers have been answered. And every prayer you pray today, your prayer has been answered. All the prayer we prayed this way coming from last Tuesday, our uh, you know, anointing service time. Uh, every prayer we prayed at that time, uh, our prayer has been answered. You look at Abraham, number one, he he's, was worshipping God and believing in God, who sees those deeds completed even before the commencement. Number two, he believed and we believe in spite of contrary physical signs. In spite of contrary physical signs. That's what we learned about Abraham. That even though he was 100 years of old. And that the Sarah was already past the age of bearing any child. But he said, I'm not going to look at that. What you see might discourage you. Might distract you. What you see might uh, kind of depress you, but you believe in God in spite of contrary physical signs. Whatever the card reads and whatever the x-ray reads, I believe I am well. Somebody there, I believe I am well. I believe I am strong. You know, whatever you feel in your spine, whatever you feel in your blood system, whatever you feel in any part of your life, you know, God said it, I believe it, and it is done. Number three, we continue to believe in the face of human improbabilities. Look at Abraham. Abraham saw that, he said, Humanly speaking, this is improbable. Humanly speaking, this is impossible. It's like 
God, why don't we change the plan? Why don't we change the program? Look at Sarah. Look at me. Are we still going to bear the child you promised? Yes, you're still going to bear. I said, you are still going to bear. You will bear fruit. The unexpected will happen. The impossible will happen. Because like Abraham, we believe in the face of human improbabilities. Number four, as we look at the faith of Abraham, we have read the passage already. We keep looking at the promise and we are not discouraging appearances. You know, as you open your eyes and you look around, discouraging appearances, you go to take your bath in the morning and you look at your body, discouraging appearances, and you look at the face of Sarah and you look at the wrinkles, uh, discouraging appearances, you look at the calendar, you look at the age of uh, Sarah, discouraging appearances, but you refuse to look at that. You are looking at the promise. The promise is greater than your personality. The promise is greater than your appearance. The promise is greater than whatever may be happening around you. That money will come. That job will come. That victory will come. That power will come. Because like Abraham, you keep on looking at the promises, not looking at discouraging appearances. Now number five, we stagger not because Abraham staggered not at any promise of God. Any promise of God. We have a lot of promises. Abraham was looking at a particular promise, just one promise. But we have promises from Genesis to Revelation. Promises from Matthew to Revelation. Genesis, uh, promises in the prophets. Promises from Christ. Promises from the Holy Ghost. Any of those promises, some of them, they look unbelievable. They look incredible. And it appears that they are way beyond every human project. Yet, we stagger not at any of the promise of God. I stagger not. I stagger not. Unbelief makes people to stagger like drunken people. It's like, how can that be? How can that be? With one mouth, they read and pronounce the promise of God. And then with the other mouth, they contradict themselves. There are people with two faces. They look this side. They see the promises. They look this side. They see the problems. And they're alternating between problem and promise, problem and promise, problem and promise. And they stagger. I will not stagger. Because Abraham staggered not at the promise of God, and we stagger not at any promise of God, that's why we're going to receive. That's why you are going to receive. Number seven, he was strong in faith, keeping unbelief outside the door of his heart. Unbelief will knock. Unbelief will try to enter. Unbelief will try to mix with your faith. Unbelief will try to come and say, can we reason together? Can we talk together? Can we discuss together? Uh, can we become reasonable? Can we look at history? Who has ever had a child at this age before your time? Can we look at biology? Who has ever had a child when the condition is like this? Can we look at science? Who has ever, in the history of science, in the history of everything we have read, in the history of everything we have known, from the history of your people to your own time, and then around you here, in your own country, in your own nation, and in any other nation, can you show anyone that has ever had a child at this age? He said, no, unbelief, keep quiet. I keep you outside the door of my heart. I keep you outside the door of my home. I keep you outside the door of my conviction. You keep unbelief outside and you stagger not at the promise of God. You are strong in faith and you are giving glory to God all the time. We know God cannot lie. How many of us know that God cannot lie? He has said it, therefore he will do it. And whatever he said, he will do. And because God cannot lie, 
That's how we stand on the promises of God in Titus chapter, chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 2. Titus chapter 1, and I'm reading from verse 2. In Titus chapter 1, reading from verse 2, it tells us the character of God, the attributes of God, and the understanding, the conviction we have, we have about God. And that's how we stand. And that's why we're standing on the promises that cannot fail. God himself cannot fail and he cannot lie. In Titus chapter 1 verse 2, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. He gave the promise and then that because since he gave the promise, he's been fulfilling the promise for other people and he cannot lie. Our God cannot lie. Your God will not lie. What he said he will do, he will do. He must do it. I said he must do it. The God we serve cannot lie. Hebrews chapter 6. In Hebrews chapter 6, I am reading from verse 18. That by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. Has he given you a promise? Impossible for God to lie. Have you read anything of the promise of God? Impossible for God to lie. Are you standing on the promises and it appears uh, somebody is saying, uh, how can that be done? How can that be fulfilled? How can that come to pass? You are standing on that promise because it's impossible for God to lie. Anytime doubt is about to come, Anytime unbelief is knocking at the door, you go back to the promise that God has given. And then you remind yourself, that's what God has said. And God cannot lie. And God will not lie. He will not lie to you. He will not deceive you. What he said he will do, he must do. And you cannot die before the fulfillment of the promise. You know, Abraham was getting older. I mean, I'm not going to die before the fulfillment of this promise because God cannot lie. No, you cannot die before the promise. The promise must come first. And the promise must be fulfilled. And that is what Abraham was standing on. And that is what Sarah stood on. As we stand on the promise of God, we'll see the promise fulfilled in Jesus' name. Number one is the promise of eternal life. It gives us eternal life. It gives us everlasting life. As we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, eternal life is ours. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And because we know God cannot lie, eternal life is available for everyone who will call upon the Lord. Look at um, Luke chapter 1. In Luke chapter 1, I'm looking at another promise in verse 72. Luke chapter 1, verse 72, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which is swear to our fathers Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we, being delivered out of the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear. I have a promise here. I said, I have a promise here. You know, some people say the enemies are increasing. It looks like the enemies will never stop. And the enemies are, like to, are likely to finish them before the fulfillment of the promise of God. No enemy can finish you. Because it says here very clearly, it says that he will grant us. He will grant me. That I have been delivered out of the hand of all my enemies. I will serve him without fear. You know, somebody said, hey, you know, my problem, Pastor, I was, it's like I was brought up to fear. I fear young people. I fear old people. I fear men. I fear women. I fear problems. I even fear what I shouldn't fear, where there is no fear. Can I be delivered out of that today, today? You will serve me without fear. You will preach without fear. You will sing without fear. 
you will pray without fear. You will walk through life without fear in Jesus' name. The conditions around and the things you hear and the things you see may try to pump fear into you. But all that fear is destroyed according to the promise of God in Jesus' name. And look at this, verse 75, in holiness and righteousness before him. How long? All the days of our life. All the days of your life, holiness, righteousness. You'll be victorious in Jesus' name. Now you've heard about this promise before. Let's look at it. I'm looking at Acts of the Apostles. And I'm reading from chapter 2. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 39. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verse 39. For the promise is unto you. And to your children. And to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. He's talking about the power of the Holy Ghost, the promise of the Holy Ghost, the indwelling of the Holy Ghost, the infiltration, saturation by the Holy Ghost, being, being uh, below and being closed by the Holy Ghost. And he said, the promise is unto you and to your children. And to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Look at verse 33. Verse 33. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost. Having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. I will see it in your life. Amen. I will hear of it in your testimony. Amen. The power of the Holy Ghost coming upon you, coming upon us, every one of us, in Jesus' name. Amen. Eternal life, that's mine. Amen. Holiness, that's mine. Amen. Righteousness, that's mine. Amen. Power of the Holy Ghost, that's mine. Amen. Healing, that's mine. Amen. I am healed. I said I am healed. You know, sometimes you may not look like it. It may look like you are sick and you are weak. But when we pray and mention the name of Jesus on you, you will be well in Jesus' name. Look at James chapter 5. James chapter 5. And I'm reading from verse 15. James chapter 5 verse 15. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. What if we pray and uh, somebody is not healed? It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. We shouldn't add what is not there. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. What if we pray and the fellow gets worse? It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. Remember? You must see the completion or the complete, the complete healing even before the commencement. Before you feel any way better, you must see that you are healed already. You are healed in Jesus' name. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And the Lord shall tell me, raise him up. Make it for yourself and the Lord shall raise you up. And if he has committed sin, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that he may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man. The, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Your prayer will avail my prayer will avail. If two of us shall agree as touching anything concerning you, it shall be done. Look at Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. And we're reading from verse 12. Hebrews chapter 6. We're reading from verse 12. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 12. That she be not slothful, be not slothful in studying the word, be not slothful in prayer, be not slothful in doing the will of God, and be, and be not, and be not, ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. 
What are you going to inherit? I said, what are you going to inherit? You know, some people say, you know, when I was young, my father told me that granddaddy had this problem and great-grandfather had this problem and my father also had that problem. And me too now, I'm getting to the age that my father told me I've inherited their problem. I will never inherit any problem. Anything coming from the background, from the family, I will not inherit in Jesus' name. I inherit the provision of Calvary. I inherit the promises of Christ. I inherit the power of the Holy Ghost. It says, by patience and faith, we inherit the promises. You are blessed. I said you are blessed. Stand on the promises that cannot fail, and you realize the fulfillment of the promise in your life in Jesus' name. Hebrews chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 23. Hebrews chapter 10, we're looking at verse 23. It says in verse 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith. Tell me how. Tell me how. Don't allow the wind of doubt to blow you around. And don't allow the wind of, uh, you know, unbelief to blow you here and there. And, uh, you know, you have confessed something in the meeting. And you have confessed something during the program. And you hold fast to that. And your faith will not waver. For he is faithful that promised. He is faithful that promised. Read it aloud. He is faithful that promised. Say that again. Disappointment is all of the past. No more. In your life, no more. Raise your head. Let me see your face. I said in your life, no more disappointment. In your family, no disappointment. In your spiritual life, no disappointment. In the work you are doing for the Lord, no disappointment. You will be full of joy. In Second Corinthians chapter two, Second Corinthians chapter one, rather, Second Corinthians chapter one. I'm reading from verse twenty. Second Corinthians chapter one, verse twenty. For all the promises of God, remember, no exception. No subtraction, no addition. All the promises of God in him are yea and in him amen to the glory of God by us. Thank God you are blessed. And nobody can reverse it. Thank God you are blessed. Even your physical condition cannot reverse it in Jesus' name. Now, point number two, point number two, spreading the prophecy of his second coming. Spreading the prophecy of his second coming. Look at what Jesus himself said about his coming again. We're looking at Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. And here we're reading from verse uh, 40. Matthew chapter 24, verse 42. It says in verse 42, watch, watch, uh, therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Your Lord doth come. Your Lord is going to come. There's no shadow of doubt. As the first coming was prophesied in the Old Testament, and in due time he came. Now the second coming is prophesied in due time. Uh, is going to come. It says in verse 43, but know, know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what hour, in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Verse 44, therefore be ye also ready for in such an hour as she think not the Son of Man cometh. At such an hour, as she think not, the Son of Man cometh. He spoke about his second coming a number of times. Not just once. If he said it only once, that was it. That was true. If he said it two times, repetition brings emphasis, or three times, or any number of times, that means that it is sure and certain Christ 
is coming again. Matthew chapter 26. We're reading from verse 64. Matthew 26, verse 64. Jesus says unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter, ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on, his, on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. I want you to understand that word hereafter, hereafter. Already he has been betrayed. Hereafter, after the betrayal. Already he was going to be crucified. After that crucifixion, hereafter, he will die. After that death, it shows there's going to be resurrection. Because how could he be coming and sitting in the clouds and sitting with power and coming with the clouds of heaven? If he was in the grave, he'll not rise again. That word hereafter incorporates everything. Hereafter, Christ is going to ascend to heaven. How could he be coming from heaven if he doesn't ascend to heaven? He was telling them quite a lot in using that word hereafter. Hereafter, he shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Coming in the clouds of heaven. The Lord is coming again. Look at John chapter 14. John chapter 14 and we're reading from verse 1 John chapter 14 verse 1 let not your heart be troubled you believe in God believe also in me you know sometimes when you hear some things your heart may have the tendency of being troubled but don't let anything trouble you from this time on Sometimes when you hear something from the village, or even something from the town here, from the other part of the town, it troubles your heart. Don't ever allow that. You know, that, that trouble of heart brings depression. That trouble of heart brings fear. That trouble of heart brings dejection. And that will weaken you. It will weaken your prayer. From now on, nothing will trouble you. There is no problem that Christ has no solution for. Every problem will receive a solution from on high in Jesus' name. And that's what we are going to talk about during the retreat. Any problem, every problem, down south, up north, any problem below, any problem from the sky, any problem on the mountain, any problem on the valley, the final solution is tell me the name. I said the final solution is Jesus. And you know, there are people who have, they have the idea that, you know, they've always been coming for a retreat, and this time now, they just want to take vacation. This is not the time for vacation. Because this retreat is going to be, is going to be a retreat. The father, the mother, the uncle, the power, and the master of all retreats in Jesus' name. Every trouble in your life gone. Every problem in your family gone. And tell your friends, tell everyone that they shouldn't allow anything, they hear anything, they see to trouble them. Let them just come. Our final solution has come. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Do you have a place in heaven? Yes. I said, do you have a place in heaven? Yes. You will be there. Yes. Look at verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, look at this. I will come again. Me. He said himself. He will come again. There is a certainty of the coming of the Lord. The second coming. And he said, and receive you unto myself that where I am, where I am, where I am, there ye may be also. How many are going to live in heaven forever? You'll be there in Jesus' name. He assures us, he gives us the assurance 
that he is coming again. The second coming of the Lord. Now, don't just know it privately. Spread it. Spread it. And tell the people all around you, Christ is coming again. Acts of the Apostles chapter 1. And Acts of the Apostles chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 9. Acts of the Apostles chapter 1 verse 9. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward where? Heaven. As he went up. Behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which said also, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? They same Jesus. Praise the Lord. They same Jesus, which is taken off from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him going into heaven. He's coming again. The same Jesus, our Savior, is coming again. The same Jesus, our healer, is coming again. The same Jesus, our sanctifier, is coming again. And when he comes, thank God, you remain faithful. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, we shall not all die, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump shall sound, the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall shall be raised incorruptible and we who are alive we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality then shall be brought shall be brought to pass the sin that is written death is swallowed up in victory oh death where is the sting oh grave where is the victory the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law but thanks be to god which giveth us victory through our lord jesus christ and because of the expectation of his coming, because he grants us the victory, because the first coming in with the atonement has that great power, indelible power, irreversible power in our lives. And because we're expecting his coming, when we shall be changed, and we're here now in between the first and the second, therefore in verse 58, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Hold on there. Always abounding. You know, there are people, they, they say, good old days, good old days. I remember 19 such and such, I was working for the Lord like no man's business. I was working with the Lord with book, both hands, and I was uh, reaping and evangelizing and praying uh, and uh, teaching, and everything was wonderful. But now, you know, I'm at a low ebb. I'm so pedaling now. It looks like the energy in me, the zeal in me is drying up. It looks like at that time it was abounding, but now it looks like I cannot make it anymore. But thank God I can make it. Till old age, I will make it. Till Christ comes, I will make it. Always abounding. Always abounding. Always abounding. You will not be tired. You will not be weary. You will not have fatigue. You will not have discouragement. If discouragement comes to kick it out like football, it will go out in Jesus' name. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. My labor is not in vain. I said my own labor is not in vain. 
your labor will not be in vain in Jesus name Christ is coming and when he comes he will meet you at the point of service he will meet me at the point of service no vacation I said no vacation no retirement or is that somebody wanting to retire then Anybody wanting to go on vacation? I'm surprised for some people that leave their district and they leave their, you know, pastoral place and they leave their ministry and they go for months. And we're asking, you know, where's sister so-and-so? Where is uh, brother so-and-so? They say she has gone on vacation. He's gone on vacation. I said, when did she go and when did he go? He's been away now for many weeks. In fact, now it's gone, gone beyond three months. Come back. I said, come back. There are some people, they don't even leave town. They're in their houses and they're in their community. But they don't go to the place of service. And the place where they always need to be always abounding, always abounding, always abounding. And I ask, uh, you know something, if I'm able to talk, I say, my brother, I've not seen you for some time. You know, pastor, the hold up in town is so thick, is so heavy. And I was just afraid to come out of my house. All that fear began in Jesus' name. Hold up. Who is causing the hold up? The people who are going for mundane things and for secular things. Those for suppose who are going for spiritual things get into that hold up. If they are pushing, push with them. If they are going slow, go slow with them. But you will come to church. You will come to your district. You will come to your place of duty. You will always be abounding in the work of God in Jesus' name. And God will reward you. I said God will reward you. We're looking at Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 1. Colossians chapter 3. And we're looking at verse one. It says, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ seated on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is seed with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear. That's talking about his coming. He's coming again. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. I will be there. I said I will be there. You know, after laboring and laboring and laboring here on earth, then maybe your last few days, your last few months, is when you, you will not give up. Somebody is so he gives up and he says, you know, the heat is too much and the pressure is too much. I don't think I can go on. I am going on. I am going up. I am going to endure. And I'm going to serve the Lord until the very end. When Christ comes, say when Christ comes, he will meet me at my post of duty. Say amen for yourself. In First Thessalonians chapter four, First Thessalonians chapter four, I'm reading from verse fourteen. First Thessalonians chapter four, and I'm reading from verse fourteen. It says in verse fourteen, for if we believe, and thank God I believe, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Will God bring with him. He's coming again. For this will say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord. You see that assurance again? There's no doubt about it. In many parts of scripture, we've been reading now from Matthew and we've gone uh, to John and to Acts of the Apostles and to First Corinthians. We could have gone to Mark and Luke as well because the promise of the coming is all there. It says unto, it, unto the coming of the Lord, we shall not prevent, proceed, or hinder them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. 
with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Like Enoch, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Like Elijah, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. What do we call that catching up? Tell me, tell me. Rapture, rapture is going to happen. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Spread the prophecy of the second coming. Look at Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, and we're reading from verse 13. Titus chapter 2, we're reading from verse 13. Titus 2, 13. It says in verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. It gives us the assurance again over and over Christ is coming again. And it says you should look for his appearance in First John chapter 2 verse 28. First John chapter 2, reading from verse 28. In First John chapter 2 verse 28, And our little children abide in him, that when he shall appear, we, shall, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him. Tell me the last three words there. Say it aloud. At his coming. He is coming. I said he is coming. Look at Revelation chapter 1. Reading from verse 7. Revelation chapter 1 verse 7. Behold, he cometh with the clouds. And every eye shall see him. And they which are pierced to him, and all kindred of there shall be which are well because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, says the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come. Which is to come. Which is to come. God Almighty. We're looking at Revelation chapter 2, verse 25. Revelation chapter 2, verse 25. In verse 25, but that which ye have already hold fast till I come. Till I come. Till I come. He's coming again. And when he comes, you'll not be found missing. Amen. Chapter 3, verse 11. Chapter 3, verse 11. Behold, I come quickly. See that. Chapter 1, he said it's coming. Chapter 2, he said it's coming. Chapter 3, behold, I come quickly. Behold that fast that no man take thy crown. Yes, now you understand. The persecutors, they're trying to deny you of your crown. The people that stand at the crossroad and they say, too much church. Too much uh, Christianity and too much spirituality, too much Bible reading. You will not go to that meeting today. They are trying to deny you of your crown. They will not take your crown from you. You hold fast what you've got that no man will take your crown. No man will take my crown. Revelation chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 15. Revelation chapter 16, verse 15. Behold, I come as a thief. It's coming suddenly. It's coming unannounced. You will not know the time or the date when he comes. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. It says, Behold, I come. He is coming. And when he comes, you will not be found missing. 
Look at Revelation chapter, Revelation chapter 19. I'm reading from verse 7. Revelation chapter 19, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. You'll be there. I will be there. Revelation chapter 22, I'm reading from verse 12. Revelation chapter 22, verse 12. Behold, and behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Are you doing any work that will be rewarded at that time? I'm asking a question. Are you doing any work that will be rewarded at that time? Let nothing take that work away from you. You see, there are people that, you know, they, they are careless with the work God has given them to do. And they say, well, I don't really care. I have a lot of things to do in the world. He has a lot of things to do for the world and for the Antichrist and for Satan. And so if you take this one away, take it. I want to, you know, go my way and I want to do this. I pray the work of God will not be taken away from my hand. I'm talking for myself. The work of God will not be taken away from your hand in Jesus' name. Look at chapter 22 of Revelation, chapter, verse 20. Chapter 22, verse 20. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. He is coming. And when he comes, he'll find you faithful. When he comes, he'll meet you faithful. When it comes, the work of God will still be with you, and the work of God will keep on prospering in your hand in Jesus' name. Amen. Now remember, the first coming of Christ, he came and he gave us work to do. The second coming of Christ is going to come and inspect us on the work he gave us to do. And so, in between the first coming and the second coming, he wants us to be occupied. And he says, occupy until I come. He gives us work to do. And as we do the work faithfully, even now in life, he will reward us. And in the life to come, when he comes, he will reward us in Jesus' name. We're looking at Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13, and I'm reading here from verse 33. Mark chapter, Mark chapter 13, verse 33. Let me back up to verse 32 for a purpose for you to understand. It's still assuring us that it's coming again. In Mark chapter 13, verse 32, but of that day and that hour, knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Verse 33, take ye heed, watch, and pray. For ye know not when the time is. Now look at verse 34. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work. He has spoken about his coming again, and this was his first coming. He was about rounding up his first coming, about going to the cross, about going to sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. And now he said, I'll be coming again. The hour, the time, the day, nobody knows. Not even the angels of God in heaven. The Father knows that day. He has reserved that for himself. But before I come, I'm going to give every believer every member of my church, every minister in my church, the work to do. So, look at that verse 34 again. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who led his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work. Every man his work. Has he given you any work? I said, has he given you any work? 
uh, you know, there are people that act as if the work belongs to the years, belongs to the pastor. And the pastor has given me this work to do. If I'm happy with him, I'll do it well. If I'm not happy with him, I'll show him I will not do his work properly. They are mistaken. Who gave us work to do? I said, who gave you work to do? The Lord has given to every man his work. And he commanded the porter to watch. He says, we should watch. What are you watching? If the work is precious, if the work is uh, fruitful, if the work is given by Christ and you love Christ, you'll watch over that work. You'll not do it carelessly and say, that's the best I can offer. If that best is not, um, you know, uh, acceptable to whoever, let them take their work. You don't understand who gave you the work. God has given you the work. And then there are people, the work Christ has given them, they're not actually doing that. If you ask them, what work has Christ given you? They say, I need to think. I really don't know the work he has given me. But what work are you doing? There is a work they coughed out from themselves. They carved out for themselves. There is a work, I'm going to do it like this and I'm going to do this. The Lord has not appointed them to do that. And they're wasting their lives, and they're wasting their resources, and they're wasting their energy, and they're wasting the valuable energy and skill they have doing what God has not told them to do, has not committed into their hands. And meanwhile, what he has committed into their hands, they do nothing about it. I pray you'll not be like that. You will wake up and concentrate on the work he has given you to do. He gave to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore. For ye know not when the master of the house cometh at evening or at midnight or at the cock crowing or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. What I say unto you, I say unto all watch. I say unto all watch where to watch. And I pray that the spirit of watchfulness, the Lord will grant every one of us in Jesus' name. Matthew chapter 24. I'm reading from verse 45. Matthew chapter 24 verse 45. Who then is a faithful and wise servant? whom his Lord has made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season. He's giving us a work to do to give the members of his household meat in due season. Not food with a whip, food with a cudgel, food with a frowning face, food, we give the people food, we shout in, we shout on them. And even when we are praying some people, I don't know why they do that, they shout on God. The rest of the people are praying, and they are asking, and they are pleading with the Lord, oh Lord, look at the promise you've given me, look at the promise you've given us. And they are earnestly asking the Lord. But the other people, instead of earnestly asking the Lord and seriously seeking the Lord, they're frivolous. They're careless. And it's like they're bullies. And they want to shout the prayer down. And you can hear their single shouting. And I'm asking myself, is that a Christian? Does he know why he's here? Does he know the work the Lord has given him to do? We see that frivolous, we see wild, like an animal. But the Lord is saying, who is a faithful and wise servant? Whom his Lord has made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season. Blessed is that servant 
whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. He cometh, is coming. And blessed are those reasonable, faithful, holy, and self-controlled servants who are doing what the Lord has called them to do. Verily I say unto you, that ye shall make him ruler over all his goods. But, look at this one, but and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord, the Lord is coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and to drink what they drunk in. Sometimes there are some servants of God, sometimes there are some preachers, sometimes there are some pastors, sometimes there are some leaders that they forget that. We only have privilege of serving the people of God. The people of God are not our slaves. The members of the church are not my slaves. They're children of God. But you see, there are pastors and preachers that forget that. And they begin to shout on the members. They begin to rebuke the members. And they begin to kind of beat the members. Jesus said there will be people that will do that. And they will say, the Lord is delaying his coming. He cannot come now. And so I will do whatever I like. And they dribble us here and dribble us there. And they do don't respect anybody. Those people will lose their reward. They may even lose their lives. They may lose their souls. Look at verse, uh, verse 15. It says in verse 15, The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour when he is not aware of, and he shall catch him Asunder, careless worker, bullying worker, and a fearsome worker, frightening worker, the one that wants to trample upon everybody and push his way through. They don't respect elderly people or young people or people who are put in position or any leadership anywhere. He says such people, they'll be caught asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. You know, those are hypocrites. They have the work from the Lord to do. They're not concentrating on the work. They're doing other things they shouldn't be doing and they're beating down other servants of God and members of the church. And he says, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I pray God will rescue us from that in Jesus' name. Look at Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 34. Luke chapter 12. We're reading from verse 34. Luke chapter 12. Reading here from verse 34. It says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. What's the meaning of that? If your treasure is, the, is in the house of God, your heart will be in the house of God. If your treasure is in the ministry that God has given you, your heart will be in the ministry. If your heart is with Christ, your heart, if your treasure is with Christ, your heart will be with Christ. Let your loins be guarded about and your lights burning and ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding that when he cometh is coming again. I said is coming again that when he cometh and knocketh they shall they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, that he shall gird himself, and make them to sit down to meet, and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch, or come in the third watch, and find them so blessed are those servants. And this know that if the good man of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready. Are they ready? 
I said, I'll be ready. We'll all be ready in Jesus' name. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. And then Peter said unto him, Lord, speakest thou this parable unto us, or even unto all? And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household, to give them their portion of meat in due season? to give them their portion of meat in due season. That means at the time you ought to serve the bread of life to the people of God, to the children of God, to the church of God, serve them. It's not when they are so tired and they are so weary and they are so hungry and they are roaming about the hills and the mountains and they are going to false prophets and they are taking poisonous food that will then come and say, okay, now you can come. I'm ready to feed you now. Give them the meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom is Lord when he cometh shall find so doing of your truth I say unto you that he will make him ruler over all he hath. But, and if that servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, I shall begin to beat the men servants and the maidens, and to eat and to drink and to be drunken. Can you imagine that? That a person is a minister. And then he's beating fellow ministers. A person is a messenger. And he's beating fellow messengers. A person is a preacher. And he's beating fellow preachers. A person is a leader. And he's beating fellow leaders. And he doesn't have any concern for the pain he's causing his fellow servants or his fellow maidens. The Lord of that sermon, verse 46, will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him asunder, and will appoint him his portion of the unbelievers. And that servant which knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will shall be beaten, tell me, with many stripes. The person knew that this is the will of God. This is the message to preach and this is the word to give. And this is how to encourage the members of the church. And this is how to develop the leaders in the church. But he leaves all that alone and is angry and is beating this and beating that and driving this and driving that. He may not get to heaven because it says he that knew his master's will and prepared not himself and did not do according to the master's will shall be beaten with many stripes. Verse 48, but he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall still be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, unto him shall much be required. And to whom men have committed much, of him shall will ask the more. We're going to be faithful to the Lord. We'll be wise. We'll do the work of God faithfully. We will watch and not become careless as we do the work of God. Look at Matthew chapter 24. He wants us to be ready. Matthew chapter 24. We're reading from verse 44. Matthew 24. Reading from verse 44. In verse 44, therefore be ye also ready. He wants us to be ready. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as she think not, the Son of Man cometh. Chapter 25 of Matthew. Matthew chapter 25. I'm reading from verse 10. Matthew 25, verse 10. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. 
and they that were ready went with him to the marriage. They that were ready, get ready. You must make sure that your salvation is in touch. You must make sure that sanctification, holiness, without which no man shall say the Lord, is still there. You must be occupied in the work of the Lord, always abounding. They that were ready went in, were seen to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. What she therefore? For ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. We'll be ready. Amen. You'll be ready. Amen. I'll be ready. Amen. I'll not get there and not find you there. Amen. You'll not get there and not find me there. Amen to be calamity. If I get there and I don't see you there, I will see you. Amen. Look at Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. And I'm reading from verse 40. Luke chapter 12. Reading from verse 40. It says, Be ye therefore ready also. Be ye therefore ready also. For the Son of Man cometh at an hour you think not. The Son of Man cometh at an hour you think not. As we get ready, we also will make other people ready. We'll get other people ready. Luke chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 17. Luke chapter 1, verse 17. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias. We need the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, filling us, dwelling in us, saturating us, enveloping us, empowering us. The power of the Holy Ghost that helps us to do the work effectively. He shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea, and Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. The Spirit of God will energize us more than ever before in Jesus' name. Amen. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and of the disobedient to the wisdom of the just and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord to make ready what to prepare the church and what to make the church ready. We are to be ready ourselves and then what to prepare the church to be ready for the coming of the Lord. This great work the Lord has given us to do, we will not forget what He has given us to do, we'll do it faithfully in Jesus' name. We're coming to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. And we're reading from verse 6. Revelation chapter 19, verse 6. And I heard a sweet word, the voice of a great multitude. And as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah. For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife, the bride, has made herself ready. Made herself ready. Made herself ready. We as ministers individually, as preachers individually, as pastors individually, as leaders individually, brothers and sisters, we get ready, and then we now get to the church, to the bride of Christ, and we make the bride of Christ ready, ready for the coming of the Lord. All our labor will be in vain if the church of the living God is only religious but not righteous, and they are not ready. Our church will be ready. Amen. And to have us granted 
that she should be arranged in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And thank God the Lord has granted us the faith and has granted us the commitment and has granted us the courage that whatever it takes, we're going to be ready. Whatever it takes, I'm going to be ready. Anybody there? You're going to be ready? Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. While we're getting ready to pray, Pastor Boniface Ekulebu is there. Come and lead us in prayer. Pastor Boniface Ekulebu. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. And say, Lord, I'll be ready. Lord, I'll be ready. Let him hear your prayer. is coming. We cannot be ready without faith. Standing on the promises and sufficiency of Christ. Like Abraham would believe. We believe the promises of God before we see those promises done. Before the commencement of those deeds, we see everything completed. That's how Abraham believed. And he became a recipient of the fulfillment of the promise of God. And he continued believing in the face of human improbabilities. Continued believing, looking at the promise, the promise of God. Not looking at discouraging appearances. He staggered not at the promise of God. What promise have you read about in the word of God? Don't stagger. Don't be halting between two opinions. Problem, promise, problem, promise, problem, promise. Stand firm. Stagger not at any promise of God. Keep on belief outside the door.
keep all doubts outside the door. Look at the problem, the way God looks at the problem. Insignificant. Nothing. Stand firm. Remember, God cannot lie. As he said, and will he not do it? He said he'll give us victory over sin. Can't he do it? Whatever the temptation, whatever the challenge, he'll make us serve him without fear. There should be no out of fear in our hearts. Our God is greater than every challenge and every problem. Daniel, your fellow believer was in that house then. He didn't fear. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, your companions in faith, believers like you. They were in Nebuchadnezzar's fire. You were not afraid. Stand your ground. Standing on the promises that cannot fail. Let him reign over every problem, over every challenge in your life. All those promises he gave at his first coming. Stand on them while you're waiting for the second coming. Enjoy the first coming while you're expecting the second coming. Rest assured, it's coming again. He said so. He cannot lie. It's coming again. Many Old Testament prophets mentioned it. It will come the first time. It will come the second time. All the prophecies they prophesied concerning the first coming have been fulfilled. The prophecies of the second coming will be fulfilled too. Angels affirmed. It's coming again. The apostles confirmed it's coming again. At the time known to the Heavenly Father, He will come. Suddenly He will come. Without announcement, He will come. When many people are sleeping unprepared, he will come. Don't slumber, don't sleep spiritually.
He commands us to be ready. Get ready. While you are waiting for the coming of the Lord, serve the people of God. Serve sincerely. Serve faithfully. Serve willingly. Serve with conviction. Know who has appointed you to the work. It's Christ that appointed you. And he gave every man his work to do. Do it. Without complaining, do it. Without being sidetracked, do it. Don't leave the work he has given you to do, and then you are doing other things that he has not given you to do. Be a trustworthy minister, a trustworthy worker, a dependable child of God, saint of God. Do it. Served in the power of the Spirit. Sub diligently and sub without the fear of any man. to receive a reward. Be ready and help as many people as possible to be ready. Without salvation, we're not ready. Keep your salvation. Don't gamble with eternal life. Without holiness of heart, holiness of life, we're not ready. Don't gamble with your privilege of rapture. Don't slide into religion without righteousness. Keep ready. In Jesus' name we pray. No extraneous amen. No, no bullying amen. No rascally amen. Just the normal amen that God will respect. In Jesus' name we pray.
Father, we thank you for this moment. We thank you for what you have taught us. We thank you because of the promises you have given us. Promises that cover every area of life. And Lord, we pray as we stand on those promises, we pray that those promises will be yes and amen in every life in Jesus' name. Amen. For our soul, for our spirit, for our body, for our family, for everyone, we pray your promises will be effective in every life. Amen. Lord, keep your people in salvation. Amen. Keep your people in righteousness. Amen. Keep your people fearless in their communities in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, that your word will be effective and will produce fruit in every life in Jesus' name. We're asking, Lord, that the path to keep on serving you to be occupied until you come and to stand faithful until then, so that when you come, will not be found wanting the grace that is sufficient for everyone. Give us in Jesus' name. We know that Christ, our Lord and Savior, is coming again. And we pray that there will be no doubt in any heart. There will be uh, no misgiving in any heart that Christ is coming. We know he's coming. Any day, any time of the day he's going to come. Keep us ready in Jesus' name. As we're occupied in your work. We'll do your work faithfully. We'll do your work fervently. And we'll do your work fearlessly in Jesus' name will not be looking at the faces of people, faces of men or women before we become faithful to you. We will do the work as if that might be the last thing we're doing before you come. And so that on that final day, we'll be rewarded in Jesus' name. Empower us more. Energize us more. Envelope us more. Saturate us more with the Spirit of God to do the work effectively in Jesus' name. Every failure of the past cancel. Yeah. Every fear in the past cancel. Yeah. And all the frivolity of the past cancel in Jesus' name. Yeah. Because serious minded soldiers of the cross yeah. that will do the work rewardably in Jesus' name. Yeah. As your people go back home, go with us. Yeah. Your power will go with us. Yeah. And your presence will go with us. And Lord, we pray the joy of the Lord will go with everyone in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray we'll keep on abounding in the work of the Lord. Until you come, we'll not look back. We'll not slide back. We'll not fall back. We'll keep on in the straight path that leads to heaven. And we'll take many, many, many people along with us. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Yeah.